Well, thanks for having me, everyone. You guys um, got, all got to understand that it all starts as a hobby. And, you know, somebody important to me once said, uh, you know, find something you love and make that your job. And I've been lucky enough to have that happen to me. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself. I'm from Scarborough, Scarborough bred, Scarborough dead. My boy Shaman used to always say, I added the part about bury me in Pine Hills. My grandparents are there. So I was like, I was born at Kennedy in Eglinton. Pine Hills Cemetery, if you don't know, is at between St. Clair and Eglinton, Alva Kennedy and Birchmill. Um, so that's where that comes from. I'm from a mixed background. My father's uh, Mi'kmaq. They're actually English, Scottish, Inu, uh, Mi'kmaq, but we just say Mi'kmaq because there's been so many mixing back and forth over the generations. Uh, my mom's French, Cree, and Creole. I don't know where her Cree ancestry is from, but they're from northern Quebec. And they have a lot of deep history in this country. Um, but I was, I'm in existence because my mother came from Quebec and my father came from down east and they met here in this great city of Toronto. And that's where I was made, uh, Scarborough. So I'm just a kid from Scarborough who uh, fell in love with hip hop in the early 80s, uh, you know, or like Grandmaster Flash, Fat Boys, Run DMC, Beastie Boys days were, you know, the pre-88 golden era. I was I was b-boying and breaking when I was 10. And I got into DJing from, you know, my uncles and just my a love of music. I just had a love of music. And I never really got trained to play any instruments. I wasn't like one of those piano kids. One of my daughters, I forced to play piano. Um, and a lot of times that comes in handy later. I was, you know, your typical Canadian hockey kid playing hockey. Um, and, you know, I was pretty good. One of my uncles, one of my great uncles is in the Hockey Hall of Fame, Jacques Plant, on my mother's side. So six times Stanley Cup winner. So um, we never thought to put me in net, but I was a center and I was an MVP. And I was kind of a little bit of a superstar up until about high school where I kind of like got more into hip hop. I started DJing and um, hanging out with my friends more and, you know, high school and what are these turntables? And, oh, you could scratch, and that's where it began for me. And then um, I started doing parties, and then slowly, little things, right? One of my friends started rapping. I started being a DJ for him. And then uh, one of my friends actually, um, who was a, one of the older guys uh, named Rumble, was a rapper, one of the first rappers in the city. So eventually I had a crew of friends, and we were, you know, a lot of us rap, some of us were DJs, some of us were just knuckleheads and hung out. And so Rumble was the first one to really get me into production. I always give him that prop because he had an SP-1200. And we're talking like 87, 88, 89-ish, you know what I'm saying? And he got, he actually had the, I didn't know until somebody, I was told the story later. He had the first SP in Canada, apparently, and he was taught how to use it by Scholar Rock. So I learned on that. And I didn't, I didn't really think about being a producer back then. I was kind of um, more into emceeing and DJing. So I, um, I started evolving. And in about grade 11 or 12, here's my U of T story. I went to David and Mary Thompson in Scarborough. And um, I took a co-op. So I wanted to be, I always thought, you know, I could be a, a get into radio as a background backup plan and you know i want to be an artist but who knew right there was nobody from toronto on an international level doing hip-hop there was no drake or anything you know um you know we had maestro and we had a lot of guys who i knew and i was hanging around at the time but you know it wasn't necessarily a viable option right it was like you know it, you know probably ain't gonna happen kid get a backup plan so in high school i did a co-op um at u of t radio scarborough campus um and i i took over a show there a hip-hop show and I, I can't remember what my exact title was but this is around the time when the bare naked ladies were going to school there and they used to actually jam in the, the student lounge all the time this is just before they really kind of blew up uh, every time i watch big bang i just it, i laugh you know because <laughs> I, I think back to those days and i'm like wow and you know i was about 
17 at the time, 17. And, you know, going to U of T instead of having to go to high school was really, really kind of what pushed me to like, you know, take the next step. And then I went to uh, Humber College um, where I studied radio. So radio broadcasting is what led me to uh, getting into engineering. So all during this time, I was, you know, DJing and, and learning how to write songs and freestyling and going to clubs and doing stuff with my crew and stuff. Um, but not really, um, you know, I hadn't made any records yet. I'd been in the studio and stuff. So I discovered one of my teachers turned me on to Trebus. So when I went to Trebus, I kind of like basically dropped out of um, Humber and just took engineering because... I just, you know, I was going to studios, but I didn't understand how to convey what I had in my head through the people I was trying to, because as an artist, I wasn't buying beats yet. I was like trying to like, you know, I had a DJ and we kind of come up with all this sample and we'd want to make a beat, but we didn't know how to do, we didn't have, we had the gear, but we didn't have the gear. And so um, I went to Trebus and then I started learning how to engineer. And that's what kind of got me into more doing production. That's where I met Gadget, who was a mentor to me, who was also a mentor to 40 uh, later. Um, but this is where I started really getting to learn um, because they had a studio there. And at night, the studio was a separate entity from the school. And Gadget was doing a lot of records. He was doing, uh, you know, Early Chaos and Cardinal and Ghetto Concept and Julie Black and Socrates and people we never heard of and the list goes on and on so I would kind of hide out in the midi lab and make beats because I have no gear and um so I I kind of like got started getting thrown in to do sessions and after that I really was you know becoming good at tracking vocals now if you're an artist um this is during the time of tape you know tracking vocals was like you know it was hard to find a good engineer now because I was uh, being an artist, I kind of knew what you wanted when you were in the booth, right? And so I came, kind of became really good at tracking vocals. And because Gadget was mixing everything, I got to sit and learn how to mix and watch and and not really being heavy on producing. I was still making beats and stuff, but I was in my head, I was putting down the mic and I was kind of like, you know what, this is fun too. And it's kind of cool. And anybody out there who's you know, nowadays, a lot of producers have to engineer more. Um, things are a lot different. But back then, it was really fun to learn stuff because I didn't really have the opportunity. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have money. I couldn't just buy stuff and play with stuff. So I, I kind of learned as I went. And I was fortunate enough to be in a situation where I was, we were doing actual records, right? And I was in this boot camp and you know, it taught me so much that, you know, at the time I might have been like, felt like I was getting beat up, but like so many lessons were learned. And this went on for years. I worked at Trebus. I ended up working there in financial aid, uh, doing maintenance, ended up building studios. They were expanding. You know, this kept me, kept my bills paid. And I had the studio, but I also was building other studios. So I was able to hide out and make beats in my free time and have access to things I didn't have access to. So this helped me kind of hone my skills. And about 2000, uh, 1999, 2000, I left the school and um, was part of a studio we built um, called Soundproof, which was over at Camden, which is Spadina in Richmond. It was built by a, a fellow named Dean, who's now passed on. Um, Dean oh, was part owner of Fluid and a bunch of clubs in the entertainment district at, at the time. So my friend Tyson, who was the head engineer, hired me to be the the night guy. And if you ever go watch, uh, if you want to see that studio, go watch the Still Too Much video by Ghetto Concept, which has uh, Snow and Maestro. Um, who else is in it? There's a bunch of people in there. Uh, in that video, you'll see that studio. There's a stuntman who produced that beat is like playing engineer in there. And that studio actually had, uh, we bought the board from Teddy Riley. So Teddy, I got to, you know, meet, meet Babyface there. That that studio was, a lot of work was done at the time there. I think I did um, track Method Man there, uh, Ghetto Concept album, uh, Seven Bills All-Star. A lot of it was tracked there. Um, tons, of, we did Pop Stars there. You know, a lot of records got, that place was only open for two, three years, I think. Uh, but there was a lot of records done there. 
And, you know, being an in the, in the engineer like that, I was able to, you know, still do production and still work on records. And I, at the time, I wasn't throwing beats to artists. So anyway, after that, I ended up building a studio with Shaw Claire uh, when he had Greenhouse, which was like down the street. And we did that for a couple of years. And then Gadget came to me and uh, we joined forces with Chris Smith and built uh, Blacksmith. So Blacksmith was actually across from Soundproof and Blacksmith was a studio I built. Um, and we did the Divine Brown album, Jellystone, Socrates. We did, there was a lot of records were done there. Um, so Chris was Nelly Furtado's manager. So he had an office, oh, it was the fifth floor and underneath was um, the studio I built. So during this is when I met 40. Um, this is actually a place where Drake and 40 met. After I left, I went back to New York um, while we were doing something. I think they were doing Jellystone. I went back to New York and started working with Redman again. So around this time, um, Socrates had signed to Gilla House. Gilla House was signed to Def Jam. Island owns Def Jam. Island owns Def Jam. Universal owns Island. Universal owns everything, by the way. Um, so, you know, I was able to go down there and that's where I met the guys who own Mirror Image. So if you know anything about New York Studios, Mirror Image and the Hit Factory were near Times Square. They also had a spot on Ninth Avenue. So I got to go over there and hide out with Red Band. This is where I got to meet everybody. So I was like deep in it meeting, you know, everybody in hip hop. You name it, I probably met them, especially the producers, because they would come by and drop beats. And these are days when producers are still coming by and bringing beat tapes, right? So, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, you know, I was going back and forth, Toronto, New York, and just kind of like learning so much and still doing records. So, you know, that went on till about 2010. I was in Atlanta with Eric. I think we did, I did tons of records there in here, like, uh, met the man album i was just because the nature of new york if you're in a studio setting things will just fall in your lap and the guys who owned mirror image at the time they would just you know i came in and all the training to go back to what i was saying earlier about all the stuff that i was when i first started learning about it all came back later when i was in these situations because i had been through stuff that it was applicable that i could be like oh snap like, thank God that happened. Or I'm, that mistake I made in 97 saved me because I know not what not to do when I'm in a room with legends or something. You know what I'm saying? And this is more in an engineer aspect because at the time, I'm not really worrying. I'm still always making beats, but I'm not worried about being a producer so much. I'm worried about just being a mixer, right? So by the time the Drake thing happens, I kind of was... Um, starting to retool i was in uh i was in new york with eric sermon and i was noticing the difference um there had been a change in the technology um now this is around the time when you were getting fruity loops had just come out you were getting um geez why can't i um remember the name of it ah the other program uh, a lot of software was changing beat making software was changing I was watching guy, young guys come in and blow my mind with stuff that I was like, wait, hold on. Cause we, I come from old school where we had gear and we did things this way and things where, you know, you had, you know, I came up with an SP 1200 and I'd sync it to my EPS or my ASR and I'd put my drums on the SP and do the other stuff over there and increase my sample time. And it was more hands-on, but the, this new change it came and the software was, everything was changing so i had to kind of stop and retool right and and learn all these software so my one rule of thumb as an engineer which applies to a producer would be that you know you always you, say you learned and you're doing records and you think you know it all you got to stay on top of what's next and new software and and fortunately for me i've been a guy over the years where people will come and and go here figure this out and i'll sit down and spend the weekend and figure out a piece of gear because i enjoy it but i want to be one step up and i might not use it but sometimes i'll pull it out or it'll be applicable so around that time i was i was seeing all these young kids in the state so i was like man i gotta i gotta sit my ass down and learn all these new softwares 
And that changed my changed my production because I was calling it cheating at the time. But once I started getting into Ableton, and this is before Machine came out, but when I started learning all these new pieces of software and putting them together with the stuff I was using for, you know, doing the sessions like Pro Tools and Logic, and I was just like, no, I had to do this because I would have got lost. I wouldn't have been able to compete. The new kids were coming in, you know, 16. If I had some of this stuff at 16, I would have been a monster. So I was sitting there going, okay. And I started forcing myself to learn it. And that's where really things started changing as a producer because I started taking it more serious because let's, let's be honest, there was way more tools available than used to be. So you could do stuff you couldn't do, right? And that's where I'll segue and get into my process because that's where my whole process has changed. Because up until that point, I was doing the standard SP, not sorry, um, MPC, Triton, whatever, whatever, plugins, trying, and technology wasn't there yet. So when things came, I had to figure out what I liked. I had to try Logic. I had to try Ableton. I had to try Machine. I had to try, you know, when the new SP or sorry, MPC came out, it was more natural for me. But what happens is now you're able to combine everything together, right? So for me now, I'm heavy and I'm, I use Ableton as my staple. So I'll go into Ableton and that's my basis. And what I like to do is I'll pull up machine, I'll pull up the MPC, and then I'll go in, I'll build my drum sounds. I'll figure out what drums I want to use. Like some, a lot of times I start from scratch. Um, I, I have libraries I built, uh, libraries I create, but I try to make every song new. So I'll take the time to sit down and go, okay, let me find my sounds cause, and, and, and map them out. And they could change because the way technology is now, um, you know, you could just one click of a button and that snare is a new snare, right? You're not really committed. So I started doing that. And then I would go into, um, they have, you know, all kinds of plugins you could pull into Ableton, all kinds of uh, synths, you know, MIDI, if you want to go there, the world's like an oyster. You just, psh, that's like a whole other, you know, it's insane. So you could pull that into Ableton. But what I really liked about Ableton was the audio, the warping. And the way I got into the warping was when I started with the machine with the slicing, but Ableton has a, a different way of doing it. For me, um, I could I could start at any tempo, say I'm at 83, 84, 85, it doesn't even matter. Um, you could go with searching tempos. There's different approaches, right? Or what I like about it is you could just go crazy. Like I just go like like a lost puppy and just start pulling stuff and seeing what how things sound and just have fun because you never know what you could stumble on. And that's the beauty of it. So you start warping and when you're warping, you can start moving. So you might have a sample that you never would have tried. That's like 138 or something. And you're like at 88 and you just, it sounds cool. And then you start changing um, the increments of, cause you can go into um, different um, notes. You can change it. You know, if you want it to be an eighth, 16th, the amount of increments um, that you can change the settings to move the, the sample around. And once you start doing that, I mean, you could literally change that sample. Then there's all sorts of things involved in that, in that window where you have um, quantizing groove. You can apply different groove patterns to it. You can, you can change, you could reverse it. You know, you could change the speed. You could change the pitch. Like you could literally do things that, I would like if I could go back to when I was 16 and my head would have exploded because it's I was sitting there with like eight seconds, you know, for the whole thing. So uh, Ableton really kind of sucked me in and I should probably call them because, I mean, if it wasn't for that, I'd probably just be on like a machine or an MPC. But because of what I learned over the years with the MIDI and how crazy MIDI is. And if you guys don't know about MIDI, you should look into MIDI because MIDI has so many different crazy applications and what you can do with MIDI files and how you can change the MIDI files or you could take a guitar. You know, they have, like I have files that are like, pick a song, a Beatles song, and you have every instrument played in MIDI. 
So let's say you're sampling a song and you're like, oh, wait, I have the MIDI files. And then you could go and actually take those sounds and find whatever sounds you want to take that. And now you have the MIDI files of a version, even your own version of that sample. Like that just takes things to a whole nother level, right? And basically there's no rules at this point, right? Where up until that point, there was rules because I had, you know, restrictions. I had sample restrictions. I had this restriction. And what's happened for me is, um, and then like, let's not even get into, now they have a thing called sound packs and construction kits. And you could take that and use those things as a sample. Whereas before you might have a sample, but you couldn't just get the guitar out of it. And you only wanted the guitar. Now you have so many different places you can pull sounds from and manipulate them. It's like pretty much anything's possible. So for me, when I started using the process, I didn't really know what the process was, but I'd start and I would, I sometimes, what I always do is, I'll always get my drum sounds or what I think I'm going to start with. And it just as a rule of thumb, I always tap in an eight bar. Um, I call it a slow hat. So I don't use a metronome. I'll, I'll, I'll note repeat and a, 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 a hi hat on the one just as a guide. And, and sometimes uh, it's a vibe, but, but I just want to make sure I'm on obviously. And sometimes I use that and I'll just start going, looking for sounds they start randomly throwing throwing saw sounds in there and samples and seeing what what sounds cool and and playing around and a lot of times that's how i start i vibe or then what will happen is i'll start building drums around something i like and then i'll end up changing my mind and 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 keeping some of those drums and going somewhere else and that happens a lot too and and a lot of times i gotta put it down for a bit if i get lost because I don't always go in with a plan. I just, and because I'm in a situation right now, for me right now, I'm, I'm in writing mode. So I'm on myself about, okay, I need to write at least one beat a day. Now, I know people who make three, four, five. Now, I'm a quality person. I, I do things like this. So I would make the beat. Let's say I've made the beat. I've got all my sounds in Ableton. And if you're going to take away anything from this, you should definitely follow this because this has saved me so many times. And I've learned this by watching producers as an engineer. You ever, uh, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I've seen guys lose files. Producers have a two track. The guy, I want to, okay, I want that beat. Okay, well, I can't find the separation. Now, as an engineer, I always want the separation. I always want to separate the beat so I can mix it. Excuse me. So when I started taking my production more serious, because one thing I noticed was being the engineer, I'd be working with a lot of producers as the engineer. So the new programs have made this so much easier. Back in the day, I would have to do something called dumping or transferring. So if I had a beat on my SP, say I had a Triton and an SP, or sorry, I keep saying SP, MPC, and I had to go to tape or Pro Tools, I would have to sync it up MIDI or with SMPTE to my master, which would be Pro Tools or, um, you know, a tape machine, right, to lock it in. Because sometimes you'd have more than, you know, the, a lot of those machines, you'd only have eight or ten outputs. So um you'd have to sync it up to do multiple passes right so as a, when the technology changed if i'm in ableton and even if i got the only time this really comes a problem is if i got machine or something and i have a bunch of sounds on there i have to go individually do that that machine track and mute and go through but the one thing cool about ableton is as a feature called when you export called individual files only so it'll export every track individually right and like right there, everything's exported. I could just pull it in Pro Tools. That's something that would take me an hour sometimes to dump a track, depending on what's going on, right? So the spe the speediness of it really made things a lot faster. But the way it applied to me was it became a rule of thumb. So what I would do is, let's say I've made a beat, 
even if I've used a machine or an MPC or whatever, it doesn't matter. I would export individual files. Now, if I had to go to a machine and go five or six tracks, whatever, pardon me, it's way faster, you know. So I'd export it and I would import it into my DAW if I'm using Pro Tools or Logic. And what I would do is I would map it out and I would arrange it and do a reference mix. Okay. And then save that file. So now let's say I lose my original Ableton file where I'm creating. I've always got that folder over there. That's the separated output export. And I've always got my Pro Tools file, which I use Pro Tools. Okay. So the other thing I do is I back everything up three times. That's the whole other thing. Now, what happens is if I lose the session where, like, if I lost the file, because back in the day, a lot of things were stored on floppies and zip drives. And sometimes if you didn't back stuff up, you know, and you could still lose stuff today. So I would have that as a rule of thumb. I always keep my song. I'm like, this beat's done. It's time to separate it. But sometimes what would happen is it would work where I would separate it while I'm still right. Say I get stuck. I'll go and I'll, I'll track it out and I'll go over there and arrange it. And then I might take a break and go back and, and add something. Cause sometimes I'm just missing something for a chorus or, or I want to change a drum pattern or I need something. I'm just not sure what it is. And you can't always force yourself creatively to like keep pushing. You got to stop and take a break. Right. So a lot of times that's an opportunity for me to go do the export and separate. And it's so much better and so much faster and it makes you more, be able to be more creative. Right. And I don't know if other producers are doing that, but I do that as a rule of thumb because, and I don't want to call anybody out. I'm still doing engineering where I'm mixing for other producers on other projects. So I'm having to dump. And a lot of times guys don't, want to separate sometimes they mix it the way that it is and send a two track from an engineering perspective i want to yeah i'm going to mix it to how your reference sounds but vocals sit differently in the spectrum in the um in the sonic it's the way it it sits so a lot of times go listen to sir i can tell who's got the vocals sitting on top i can tell um because i've been doing it so long Sometimes it sounds cool. Sometimes, in some regards, the way hip hop used to be live over uh, the vinyl, it's okay. But sometimes, you know, from a mix perspective, it's not always a good thing. And sometimes I've had no choice. I've had, I'm like, well, you could remake the beat because we've lost the beat. That's happened to me before. Um, and you don't really have a choice, right? Which is why the rule comes into play. And it's happened to me recently. I've renamed something and I couldn't find it. But I had that file that saved me. So I was, it, it, it works. The system works. The other part about it is keeping in line with file management. That's where I personally am, am bad is keeping my file management in order. So when I do have a problem where I need to go find something, um, it's easier to find. Now, I know you could search, but back in the day, we only had disks, right? Um, and I have so many drives. I keep all my drives in safes. Because you don't want to have that happen to you where you lose. Trust me. <laughs> you don't want to lose it. So that's a little bit about my process. Um, I could go into more details about certain aspects of them. Um, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, elements within the programs that come into play. I'm not sure what everybody's using. A lot of people use Reason. A lot of people use Ableton. A lot of people are using um fruity loops i've been getting into fruity loops um just i'm more like i kind of want to learn everything just to know it you know what i'm saying um in case in case um in case you know i'm in a situation as an engineer i don't want to be on the spot where a producer oh da, da, and i'm like i don't know what to do right you, you know it's more of a from that perspective and i mean I, the only way you're going to fall in love with something is to kind of like try new things. You can't like, I don't try to like right now I'm, I'm heavy on the machine for the last month, but I've been having my MPC and machine going at the same time. Right. Um, something led me back to that, but 
that's not important. Um, I wasn't stuck into like, ah, I'm just going to use my MPC. You know what I'm saying? Um, and um, I'm not against, you know, a lot of times I do stuff like I add live instruments. Um, there was a song on my album, uh, Spirit of Hip Hop, that came out last year. At the last minute, there was a sample I used. The um, They wanted, they didn't, I mean, it wasn't much. They wanted five. 5,000 and 5,000 it was 10,000 um and I didn't know if that song was you know do I spend that money um so I pulled the sample at the last minute played a piano and had my friend play guitar and bass and it sounded way better and the song was more organic and I kept my it sounded like a sample because what I did was after we did that I took that back and resampled it and popped it back in the song and back in my mix and it, it just it happened to work right and i was able to do that because of my engineering chops you feel me um there's things i got to lean on um and you know at the end of the day it was a good decision but that doesn't always happen sometimes it doesn't work sometimes you try to change that sample and it's just not the same you know um and i've been in that situation too so i mean you can't but you can't be afraid to try stuff you know that's the key here and and I come from not a musical background, so I've noticed working. I have friends who've been, you know, professionally trained, and I think outside the box because of that. Because um, I call myself a hack. I can't play any instruments. Like I always think, who the hell am I? Because I'm doing records and stuff, and I don't know how to play. Like I'm trying to learn stuff, but you know, I always wonder, like, how good could I be if I were to learn? You know what I'm saying? So. Don't be afraid to learn because it, it always, all these things come into play, right? And I've really been lucky, um, you know, considering the career I've had. I mean, I didn't even get into, you know, I've I've been able to work with, you know, I have Jay's credits on Drake Records or Jay-Z, song with Jay-Z or, or I even forget sometimes I was, t- I was in an interview. It was like, yeah, Rick Ross, I got Lil Wayne, The Dream, uh, I've recorded Patti LaBelle. The whole of Toronto, Socrates, Cardinal Official, Chaos, Julie Black, uh, Ghetto Concept, Point Blank, um, Maestro, uh, Red Life. Uh, I did the Grassroots album. Like, there's so many I'm forgetting. Um, work with guys, you know, I've worked with guys from the Rascals, um, Jordan, uh, Glenn Lewis, uh, Divine Brown. Um, I forget. Wu-Tang. I've been in the studio with, you know, I was, I was telling the story the other day where I was like, I'm in RZA studio sitting at the console. It's an SSL, like a big ass, you know, 128 channel SSL. It's crushed velvet. Everything's in, cr- you know, he got the big ass producers made at the back. At the time he was using ASRX linked up with something else. You know, he had like a, a Juno out, the Juno keyboard. Um, and I'm sitting there and old dirty had already passed. But I was just called in. I think I was working at Mirror Image at, and and uh, Red and Meth had the same manager. So Ellis had hit me. Yo, can you uh, go down the street to 34th and cover a session for RZA? Okay. You know, I knew a couple of those guys. You know, I'm sitting there and looking around and I'm doing vocals and I'm like, God damn, the whole who's in here? Like, I looked back because I always remember like everybody is there. Everybody except odb obviously right and you're just like oh wow how did i get here like and that's the thing about new york right and just and being confident and you know, i wasn't there as a producer but you know i could have got nervous but i didn't because i already been doing this for so long right and i noticed a lot of artists appreciate stuff like that you know um so you know i'm from um scarborough and i came up kind of rough so i'm not really scared of nothing so i don't really feel no way about being in brooklyn i've I spent a lot of time in brooklyn I, i've been to harlem i've been all kind of places where it's just like home again so like I, that was never an issue for me i was never starstruck the only person i ever got starstruck with see the problem is red man is my favorite rapper so once i was around red it was like, like whatever <laughs> you know so i mean i was down there i got to work with epmd i got to do you know um you know spend years around eric sermon working you know with keith murray working with different artists working you know working with guys i never thought i imagined i 
you know, I'd find myself in Atlanta with, with Eric, you know, and, and once I was in the studio with, with music, soul child and Eric, just going through beats, like so many situations that I'm like where I came from, I never thought it would, could be possible. Right now, the moral of the story here is the engineering kept me in the game. Now I could have just been like my beat making was a hobby that came from being a, a DJ that came from with, with hip hop being like, Oh, I like to rap. And then my friends, Oh yeah, we'd have fun. It was just fun. It wasn't supposed to be like, Oh, I'm going to make a job out of this. Right. That was impossible from where I was from. So by the time you go move forward to where I'm engineering, I learned, you know, when I was in school in engineering, they had a fourth term production and the producers um, term was always saying, you know, every good producer knows how to engineer. Right. And that's so more, more applicable nowadays because a lot of the producers, like I said before, have to engineer their own stuff, whether they know how to or not, or they mean to or not. And I was lucky, so lucky that I was always able to just fall into situations. Now I'm a hard worker. And that's the basis. I will work my butt off. And everybody knows that about me. Um, so it's not like, oh, I got lucky. It's not saying that. But I was lucky because not everybody gets to get through having, you know, coming where I could. Like, I came with nothing. But I had heart enough to learn. And sometimes that stumbles. Like, I know a lot of people who, are like, have careers because they were, it was a hobby. And they, they got a big hit. And then now they have a career out of it. And they probably, some of them make more money than me. You know what I'm saying? And I don't care about that. I'm not mad. I'm happy. Because that's the only reason I'm here. Because I just, I never gave up. And I keep going. And it wasn't always something I made money at. I always had a day job. Even before I worked at Travis, I had a day job. I used to work at night. You know, and but I'd go to the studio. You know, I'd go make beats because it was a hobby. You know, if I could make money at this, that would be amazing. If not, it's okay. I enjoy it. It's fun. It's not supposed to be like when you have that motive, that's I think when it doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like it's I could tell you guys the same thing applied to my visual art. I started painting again. I started uh, um painting the first time was when I to go back to when I went to radio, when I went to radio at Humber. When you apply for college, and you guys know this because you're in university, let's say, you have to have a backup on your application. I did visual arts, so I had to have a portfolio, and they asked for painting. So I was like, shoot. At the time, I had, uh, I was working night shift. I think I was on two or three kids. I was like 19. Uh, so I started painting in the mornings, and I did a few pieces. I was like, oh, this is, like, I like this. And I didn't paint again for um, probably 20 years until I started reconnecting and doing ceremony. And, and when I started painting, it just, it opened a floodgates. And ultimately, like I make money from painting that I was never planning on actually doing. I was just painting as a hobby because I wanted to put something on the wall, but it became a thing where I was in the McMichael. I like my artwork is on Apple Music. Like, like that's is applicable here to the, the music because you don't know what could happen, right? You know, and all it takes is that one little thing, like um, it could be an inspiration from somebody. It could be, you know, I've had people tell me all the time, you know, like um, something happened between us and they they took that and it, it, it changed something for them. Right. So, I mean, you know, these are also life things, but they apply to to production, because if you get frustrated making a, a song that can change the song. Right. It's. It's an energy, you know what I'm saying? Whatever you're writing, whether you're sampling, whether you're playing, whether you're, you know, all these things are energies because you got to keep in mind none of this is real, right? We're all just, it's all energy. We're energy, the music. So where's the music coming from, right? Where's this, why, why am I, why am I this lucky? Well, there must be something else going on that I can't explain. So I got to kind of keep an open mind about this, which is, goes back to the retooling so i'm like okay what would happen if i didn't do that i i might not even have done album i might not have even started i might have just stuck with just um mixing right because there was a time where i just wanted to be the guy just mixed i it was like uh 
a thrill, let's say. Oh, I just mixed, you know, there was a time where we were like, oh, we mixed all the top records in Canada. I was in the States before I realized that, where somebody told me, yo, you are you kidding me? It's like you're in America and you got the top 10 on Billboard, all the top 10 albums. Oh, I mixed all the top 10 albums this year. Oh, shoot. Like, that was the goal. And But, like, how much, how often can you keep doing that? And it took me a while to realize that, being a mixing engineer is also like torture because like they use that method in war sometimes playing the same song over and over. And if you've ever really had to mix a song, that's why I do things now. Nowadays when I mix, I don't mix back in the day, especially if somebody was paying the way things would go, somebody would come in, you would start and you would mix the song and you'd be finished by the time the session's done. Sometimes you'd recall. They had a thing called total recall because things weren't on computers. Things were in gear. You'd have to use patch and you'd have to write everything down and pull up all the settings. Sometimes it would take hours to recall a mix, right? So you couldn't just pull up a session and it sounded the same. So nowadays, I, I'm i mixing five, six songs at a time. I'm going back and forth and living with them, what I call living. I live with my mix so that I can play them in the car and go, oh, because before I couldn't go, ah, oh, damn, I can't change that now. It's done. It's printed. It's out. It's off to the label, right? So nowadays, that technology has made things a lot easier for me um, to be able to do stuff like that. And, you know, this has changed me as far as how my production works, because I can go back now and change stuff as far as the production. Right. And, you know, coming off the heels of doing a producer's album, you know, that's like saying a lot because I didn't really think about what I was taking on. I mean, you know, all those artists. Uh, organizing you know you're going to be making a lot of beats not everybody's going to be meshing on certain things you want to be innovative like there's all, all these variables it was a big challenge um i probably didn't think it through but i mean we still pulled it off um so i mean when you think about just one song you know um and then music then you got to think about music what's going on in music and music's changing mixes or mixing is changing um, how how songs are sounding, depending on the type of music you're producing. Um, you know, there's different styles. Um, and all these things come into play, right? And then when you start meshing, like I took a big risk um, with Turtle Island. I had like powwow step, hip hop, and then dance hall in there. And, you know, it. I I I loved it, but it could have been like, it might not work. No, you know what I'm saying? So, you, but you got to be able to try stuff like that. So, I mean, all these things come into play. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is this you just want to have fun with what you're doing and, and make something, you know, make good music. And, um, and hopefully, you know, you can take something out of that, you know, because sometimes you're not an artist, you're just writing the music, right? Um, a lot of times nowadays, people are both. And, you know, that could, you know, I have a friend who's um, an extremely talented producer and artist, and I wanted to produce a song with him, but then we were afraid, like, it might change his sound because he sounds so good. Like, I'm like, it's fine the way it is, you know, <laughs> like, we just leave it the way it is, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, these things, um, these things, um, you kind of got to pick and choose, you know, you kind of like, there's a lot of stuff you pick up, um, for example, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ethic. It's an ethical thing, um, how you conduct yourself in a session um, with an artist, um, how, you, how you conduct yourself with the people around you. Because sometimes, I mean, right now, we're in this, still in the pandemic, but when sessions are normal again, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of like, you know, these things are factors that, and they, they also bring back that, that communication factor, right? So a sometimes you'll be working with, um, you know, if you're working with an artist and you're writing something together, that communication has got to be there, especially if you don't know the person. Um, I like to get to know somebody and spend time with them before I, like just collaborate them and you know what I mean? Because I don't want things to be forced. Sometimes people expect miracles. Um, 
you know, um, and sometimes things need to evolve. I just recently finished a song that evolved and um, I wasn't sure of the direction and, and now I get what they wanted, um, which was a little bit different than the normal because sometimes I'll try to, you know, I, there's a certain formula, but that formula doesn't always apply. You know what I'm saying? Um, it doesn't always apply to what, you know, you, you got to try things really is what I'm saying. And, and that's really been the, the main, um, the main factor for, you know, evolving is, is trying different things. 